Good afternoon. It is Sunday, August the 14th, 2016. I'm Mike Snyder. I'm here at the Carlisle Fire and Rescue Services Museum, along with Charles Yurick, who's known to most people as Randy. Good afternoon, Randy. Hello there. Uh, before we begin, I need to confirm that you're aware that you're being audio and video recorded and that you uh, give your permission for that. Yes. Okay. Uh, just a brief amount about you to start with. Where are you from originally? Originally from Ludnick County, Palmyra. Okay. That's vain. And what did your folks do there? My uh, father was, uh, he actually worked for a Buttercrust Baking Company, which is called Wholesome, and my mother was basically pretty much a stay-at-home mom. Okay. Do you have siblings? Uh, nope, no brothers, no sisters. Okay. Did you become involved in the fire department there in Palmyra? Yes, I did. When was that? Uh, May of 1970. And how old were you then? 18. And how old are you now? 64. Okay. Um, so they didn't have a junior member program. You were able to join when you turned 18. That's Yeah, they did not have a junior member program when I joined, but shortly thereafter they did start one. Okay. Can you describe what it was like at Palmyra when you first joined there? Um, did they have uh, what level of training? Was it on-the-job training, or did you go somewhere? Uh, basically, most of the training was done uh, training nights for every Wednesday night. And also they had their own county fire training school, so going there. Uh, not really too many other outside classes when I originally started, but then more became available and traveled to different areas of training. Okay. Do you remember what kind of apparatus or equipment they had when you started? Uh, yes, I do. What was that? Well, the uh, first out engine was a 1959 B model open cab Mac. And then the second engine out was a 1950 uh, Mac uh, conventional. It would have been a F model, I believe, what the model was at. And then they also had a 1954 Mac B model open cab, which was a quad. Uh, carried basically a large complement of ground ladders on it. Uh, the rescue squad was a walk-in style uh, van type unit. Uh, that, I believe, was a... I believe that was in uh, about mid '60s. I'm not sure they hear that. And then at that time, they they still they ran one ambulance, and that was a Cadillac ambulance. Okay. Was Palmyra a pretty busy company in Lebanon County then? Uh, it was a fairly busy company. Yes, it was. Do you know roughly how many calls a year that you ran there? Back in that day, I would say they may have run maybe 150 calls a year. Okay. Um, so when you first joined, um, was it something that you personally found interesting or was it um, some friends from school or how did you get to the fire station to start with? Pretty much just an interest as a, as a kid. Uh, actually uh, became a little bit more involved. Uh, actually, uh, who I was dating, her father was involved in the fire service as well. Okay. Uh, and her relation was very heavily into the fire service. Okay. Fire. Was your father involved at all? Not at all. Okay. Uh, and then were you uh, an officer or any position of responsibility there in Palmyra? Uh, I did serve as a lieutenant for one year and a captain for one year before relocating. Okay. Can you think of any uh, incidents or times that stand out in your mind from your time there? Regarding uh, the large fires, uh, I can remember several of them. Uh, probably the first large fire was shortly after I joined, I believe it was in the summer of 70. Uh, it was the uh, Hershey Lumber Yard fire, uh, which was quite a large fire. Um, and then uh, uh, having training and becoming more of an interior firefighter, probably one of the first interior fires I went on uh, was a, uh, unfortunately a fatality fire where uh, basically two children uh, uh, succumbed in the fire as well as there was one that uh, was in very critical condition with burns. Okay. Was that something that um, dissuaded you at all, seeing something like that so early in your career? So I think it just made me more interested to, to helping people, really. Okay. When something like that happened, um, did the older members... Um, how was that handled within the company? Was that something that was talked about at the station, or was it just you're on your own, that's that's what happens here? Well, at, at that time, it was really pretty much on their own. There really wasn't a, a lot of uh, 
meetings after that to critique and uh, mm -hmm. you know to just see how everybody was doing after that type of call like it is today right who were some of your influences there at the company that were mentors or that you respected uh, one uh, was actually the, uh, the fire chief at that time uh, he was uh, he came from a, a history within the fire service of his father in the past being very active in the fire company. Uh, also, there was uh, another gentleman, um, and uh, well, the fire chief's name was Roy Kreiser at the time, and then there was another gentleman, actually two of them, which were really very good interior firefighters, one uh, by the name of Bob Sells, and the other by the name of uh, Harold Brightbill, very good uh, very good mentors to me. Uh, basically, uh, actually Harold's still active today in the fire company down there. So. What type of career were you doing at that point? I was, ba uh, at that time, uh, getting out of school, uh, I actually uh, took a trade as to uh, woodwork and carpentry and, and worked for a cabinet finishing company. Okay. And then at what point did you make your way to Carlisle? That happened actually in the fall of 75. Uh, actually at breakfast one morning reading the newspaper and saw an ad for a uh, career uh, operator in the uh, in Carlisle at the Friendship Fire Company uh, applied for the job in the fall of 75 and uh, was hired and started on in January 6th of 1976 okay so about 40 years ago uh, you started your career who did you replace do you remember Four years ago. Forty. Uh, oh, 40 years ago. I'm sorry. Uh, yes, I did. Uh, actually, at that time, the Friendship Fire Company actually went to a two-driver system where they only had one single driver. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the two drivers, me being one who drove the daylight shifts, uh, was Laverne Baker. Okay, so you replaced, replaced uh, Laverne Baker, who had been the full-time, round-the-clock driver. That is correct. And who was the night driver that was hired with you? Uh, his name was Art Brandt. Okay. So Art lived there at the fire station in an apartment with his family because he was the night driver. And where did you live? About a half a block down the street on C Street. Okay. Do you remember what your shifts were during that time period? Was it 6 a.m. to 6 p.m.? That is correct. It was 6 a.m. Okay. to 6 p.m. Uh, Monday through Friday. Okay. And during that period, um, the Friendship had just received a new fire engine, right? They already had had that by the time I started. It was a 75 on, yes. That was okay. already in service. What other equipment did the Friendship have then when you started? Uh, they had a 1966 Pioneer with France, uh, which was uh, considered the rural engine. Uh, they had a uh, utility vehicle, and I believe that was like a 1963 Chevy somewhere in that neighborhood year wise and they still had the old uh, Peter Persh engine in 1953 which the Burr engine was a 1975 on and that's what replaced the 53 Persh. Okay and there had been a, a building constructed to the rear of the main station there at 636 Northwest Street that was fairly new when you got there. Yes right. that was pretty new I guess they I guess they actually built that in in 75 or somewhere it was very new when I got there yes mm -hmm. uh, what are some of the things that happened there was the company um, having events in that building at that time when you got there no they were not just storage of apparatus okay so what do you recall about the friendship fire company when you first got there was it um, a social organization or was it uh, pretty focused on firefighting um, how many people generally hung out there? What was the active membership? Well, when I first started, um, I would say it was both. It was very active and very dedicated to the fire service. Uh, I believe that the uh, line officers made it that way, to be very honest with you, as to the way they did their operations. And uh, it, was, it was very social. You know, I think it was family-oriented more, uh, you know, so... Members, we had, I, I can't tell you exactly how many members, but I would say we probably had about 30 or so very, very active members. It, was, it wasn't too hard to fill, since you only really responded with one engine. Uh, with people on station, it really wasn't too hard to, to fill the apparatus up in those days. 
I mean, I can remember going down the street in 75 Horn with a driver and officer, one in each of the jump seat areas. So you got six there, and I can remember five, six hanging across the tailboard in those days. Mm -hmm. um, do you remember roughly how many calls the company handled when you got there? No, but I'm going to say it was, I think, around a 300 call volume. Okay. Who were some of the leaders of the company when you got there? Uh, the fire chief was uh, Gary Nicholson. Uh, the deputy chief was uh, Bob Wazowski. Uh, the uh, president uh, at that time was uh, Doug Moyer. Uh, secretary was uh, Creedy Cleland. Uh, treasurer was, uh, oh my, last name was Nicholson. And which one was it? But I can't remember. Paul? No, it wasn't Paul. J.R.? That's terrible. I can't okay. remember that. We can move on uh, from there. Um, did you uh, get along fairly well? I mean, was it an easy company to walk into and acclimate yourself? I think it really was. Uh, it wasn't really very long after that that uh, I ended up getting... Uh, uh, basically elected as uh, an assistant chief and then I think the following year moved up into the into the deputy chief's position there. Okay. During that time period, the late 70s, really early 80s, um, do you remember any specific incidents or calls that stick out in your mind in our area? Well, I think we saw definitely a lot more fire than what we see today. I, I guess that's a good thing. Um, well, just trying to think of some of the calls we may have had then. Uh, I know at one time in the, in the later part of the 70s, we had quite a rash of uh, barn fires in our, in our areas. I know that. I can remember that. It was about four or five of them in a row. A lot of them in North Middleton? North Middleton and Lower Frankfort Township. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of those were the responses uh, with the rural pumper? Yes, that is correct. And that was replaced in 1979 with a Han that was very similar to the, the Burrow engine. Yes. Um, were you part of designing that apparatus? Yes, I was. Okay. Um, the Friendship was going through a lot of changes during that time period, a lot of um, sort of progressive ideas. Um, one of the things that they did was uh, large diameter hose. Um, do you remember how all that came to be, who came up with that idea, and how that was implemented? Well, at that time, that really came up and was actually governed a lot by the uh, the fire chief at that time, Gary Nicholson, a very big proponent of that. I can remember our first uh, purchase of a LDH hose, our camera hose, was 4-inch hose, which uh, was actually put on the 1966 American La France. We did not even have the 79 at that time. Uh, and then when we bought the 79, we ended up going to 5-inch hose, and we sold all the 4-inch hose, I know, to North Middleton Township. Mm -hmm. And because of that, uh, I think the company ran some calls that were greater distances that we normally would not go to. I, yes, I think one of those was like uh, Shippensburg or Gettysburg. Do you remember well, those the, large the, the fires? Big, the biggest ones I can remember was the Gettysburg Hotel fire. Mm -hmm. And were you on that call? Yes, it was. And the, the company went there and used the hose? We basically uh, were one of the primary engines of relaying water from a uh, large pond uh, to the square to assist in water supply at the square where the water system for the hydro system wasn't supporting it. And that's the hotel that's now been refurbished and renovated? And Yes. Um, do you remember any other experiences um, due to those long call responses, do you remember the Shippensburg fire, of the church? I do remember that. Actually, that call there came in uh, the morning following one of our, one of our awards banquets. That do was you remember March. That? Yeah. Yes, church on, large church on Queen Street in Shippensburg. Um, one of the other things that the company did during that time period was um, you talked about the 1953 perched engine. It was converted into a chemical wagon. Uh, can you talk a little bit about some of the ideas that went into a hazardous materials response vehicle? 
Well, we feel we felt really with uh, the highway system that we had with the interstate and uh, and also the uh, of course the turnpike uh, that uh, there was wasn't anything around this area to handle it other than maybe a military installation or airport style response units. Um, so we decided to uh, more or less make a foam unit out of the uh, 53 perch as well as uh, it also carried uh, a large uh, uh, unit which had uh, dry chemical powder on it as well. So we, we renovated the perch, we repainted it, um, did a lot of upgrades to it to, uh, to make it a, a foam response unit. And a lot of that work was done in-house? Uh, Actually, other than uh, painting of the unit, all the work was done in-house. Okay. And then a little after that, in the early 80s, um, the Friendship Fire Company, along with Vigilant Hose in Shippensburg and Lemoyne in Wormlingsburg, formed the County Special Hazards Operations Team. Um, were you part of that process as well? Yes, I was. I was one of the. Uh, I was actually the central uh, response chief for that team. Um, can you tell us a little bit about? some of the work that you did with that team. Do you remember roughly how many responses you went on per year and where some of those were, what the activity was? Uh, as to the number, I really wouldn't know exactly the number, but uh, most all those were all. I mean, uh, basically a lot of them were highway incidents uh, with uh, involving accidents of having hazardous materials. Uh, also, uh, uh, we would go quite often over to Dolphin County because they did not have a team at that time to the truck stops uh, and they would have uh, leaking materials from uh, trucks that were just uh, in the uh, in the resting area or uh, overnight area. Uh, I can remember going to uh, a couple, uh, we went to a large hazardous material incident over in Adams County which was Angro which had to do with fertilizers. Uh, that was on a Saturday evening, I can remember. Uh, we also uh, went to uh, places, uh, I can remember going to Lebanon County one day to, uh, I believe the place was called Murray Stakes, which was an anhydrous ammonia leak uh, going down there. So we, we kind of really got around because uh, uh, there was, uh, the other counties didn't have hazmat response teams at that time. You remember uh, who some of the other chief officers were that helped to form that team and were the original leadership? Uh, yes, uh, basically the, the three area chiefs at that time were uh, the West Shore or the eastern part of the county, that was Steve Fair, he was the regional chief there, uh, and basically the main uh, operations person for the team at that time. Uh, as I said, I was in the center area and in the west end of the county was uh, the fire chief that was uh, presently at uh, the Vigilant Hose at Shippensburg and I hit Dan Byers. Okay. Uh, one of the other activities that the Friendship started around that time period was a quick response EMS service. Um, do you remember the formation of that and how that came to be? Well, we were very concerned about the north side of town. At that time, um, we had uh, railroad, well, we still have railroad goes through town, but it's, it's not an active through line as to what it was in those days. And of course, the, uh, the ambulance service sat on the uh, south side of the tracks and we were the north side station so we felt that was very uh, um, to an advantage to other people on the, on the north side of town to have quicker emergency response with the railroad. Uh, it took quite a lot of work to do with the ambulance company to really bring everything on board though at that time there wasn't a whole lot of agreement originally with the, the concept but as we worked through it uh, I think uh, uh, it, it worked very well as, as we progressed over the years. So there was some controversy with the Cumberland who was providing the BLS ambulance transport service. They weren't necessarily in favor of that. Not at first, they weren't now. Okay. Um, do you remember any particular EMS calls without names or specific locations that were interesting to you or stick out in your mind? Not really offhand, to be very honest with you. Um, I can remember doing a lot of calls going to the Molly Pitcher 
mm-hmm. and also to Jim Wilson, to be very honest with you, as the medical assist. Those two, ho- those two hotels we had quite a lot of responses to. But, but all in general, not, not really per se some EMS calls that really stuck, stuck out there. Now, those buildings are not on the north side of town. Did the company respond to other areas of the town if the ambulance was committed? That's correct. Okay. Um, how long did you work as a full-time driver for the Friendship? Uh, I, that would have been probably, I'm trying to think, I um, stopped driving at the Friendship. It's either late 79 or early 80, that's my guess. Okay. Then you pursued some other career interests, but you stayed on as an elected officer with the company. That is correct. And when did you become fire chief? Do you remember? Wow. Uh, Let's see. 1984 sound right? It would have been early to mid-84s. That's that's probably pretty close, Michael. Um, I'm trying to think of when uh, when Gary Nicholson actually moved up as the deputy chief of the borough. It was one year after that when he made that move. Uh, there was one fire chief that was in between uh, Gary Nicholson and myself for a year. Mm-hmm. Um. Who were some of the other folks that you were working with at the time um, when you first came on board as fire chief? Well, uh, some of the names that uh, I can think of were, um, of course, Bob Snyder. Um, Gary Minnick, John Neal, Ken Yarlett. Um, those are some of the the ones at the start, uh, Ron Wright, uh, Steve Good, later on a little bit was Rick Barrick. Uh, one of the other ones at the start would have been Bill Schroeder. So those are some of the names I can think of offhand mm-hmm. there. Did you ever live at the station? I was a live in it at, at different times at the station, yes. Is that something that um, was a good experience? Were there a lot of people that lived at the station at the time? Uh, Yes, our bunk room was pretty full. I would say we probably had, might have had about six live-ins at that time, somewhere along that line, Mm -hmm. I would say. About six or so. Okay. During the... 80s during the early period of your uh, term. Um, do you remember any incidents in Carlisle or in the area that stick out then? Were you at the Molly Pitcher? Yes, the Molly Pitcher fire would have been one. Um, that would have been uh, a little bit. La- that would have been a little bit later on because uh, actually we were. We were coming back at night because we were out looking for a new chemical wagon or to replace the perch, and we were on our way back. We were in the Philadelphia, New Jersey area when that yeah, I called. think that was late 83, early 84. Somewhere around there. Um, Molly Pitcher would have been one. Um, I know we had, uh, uh, I know we went to, uh, yeah, but that would have been that would have been even before my time, though. I mean, as to the chief, I was just thinking a uh, uh, woodcraft fire up in Dickinson Township, but that would have been back when we still had the Pioneer of France. Um, well, when I was chief, would have definitely been the Shippensburg Church fire, uh, of course, as we talked about earlier, and of course also the uh, Lincoln Square Hotel in Gettysburg. Um, It's really not some that really kind of just stick out in my mind, to be very okay. honest with you. All right. Um, a little bit later, um, the company bought several versions of, of special units, which was the EMS response vehicle, and I believe uh, one of those responded to the state prison riot in Camp Hill. Were you involved with that at all? Uh, actually, yes, it was. Um, we actually uh, 
went down. We were part of the uh, to help for EMS and, and triage of, of, of the rides uh, during that, that time. Did you feel uh, when you went there that everything was in hand or did it seem like it was pretty chaotic or what were your thoughts? Uh, I thought it was pretty chaotic. I didn't think there was ba basically a lot of safe situations to be in when that was going on. It was very, it's kind of an uncomfortable situation. It just didn't seem to be under control, you know, when we first got there. Mm -hmm. uh, as, as to exactly what was going on inside the prison, uh, it was not really relayed, you know, as to uh, a lot with the some even the injuries, I think, of what went on there. I thought it was, uh, information was pretty bleak as, as to coming out and, and giving us information outside of the prison area there. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, moving on a little bit, um, anything that happened in the 1990s that sticks out in your mind? I know the company got a new engine in 1990, got a Sutphin engine. Um, any calls or any activity that sticks out there? Well, basically even even before we got the Sutphin engine, I think one of the, the things that uh, really set the, uh, the groundwork and, and it's even part of today and it, it moved around was one of the biggest things I can remember was uh, back it actually if we back up to uh, even uh, 1984 when the uh, when the Cumberland Goodwill um, Cumberland Fire Company and Goodwill Fire Company merged into one mm -hmm. um, that is kind of when it was started a little bit of a start of some of the fire companies uh, getting away from a borough and rural engine and that was a precedence that was kind of set on that merger where they went from two engines down to one and that engine ran in and out of town responses and shortly after that it was time to uh, do something with the uh, 75 Hawn as to uh, either replacement or just a refurbishment on it and uh, we were able to talk the Borough Fathers into uh, basically uh, us taking over the 75 Hawn and actually selling that and giving them the title the 79 which had a lot more equipment on it and everything and we ran we went down to a one engine concept the running in and out of town responses mm -hmm. and then that of course that continued on of course when we uh, when we were able to uh, we bought a uh, 1987 Sutphin and that was in 1991 when that was purchased uh, and that was actually a used engine that we found and saved a a lot of money and gave us a lot of uh, response up to actually 2008 until it was finally replaced. And during that time period, um, during the early 90s, the company sort of realized that the facilities that they were in were not sufficient. Um, there were some problems with them and the company started to look around for um, different housing options. Do you remember that process? Yeah, actually that even started way before uh, the 90s, to be very honest with you. Uh, that even started back even in the day. There was a lot of hope and interest even before I was the chief and Gary Nicholson was the chief. We looked at different properties. Uh, one of the biggest ones we actually looked at, uh, but, but never really acted on it because of funding and money, was actually the old federal equipment area, which is now, of course, uh, townhouses as well as the, the borough police station now the municipal station there right so, so the 200 block of Lincoln Street yeah, so that I mean that was looked pretty hard years and years ago and then uh, we definitely need to do something with our facility and uh, we heard also at that time that the uh, the Empire hook and ladder was interested in looking for new quarters as well and uh, we finally decided to get together for a meeting and thought it would be our best interest that maybe we work on this project together and, and instead of building two separate stations, build one station to house both fire companies. So that joint organization, the Empire Friendship Firefighters Association, was founded in January of 1992. Um, do you remember some of the people that were the beginning of that organization that helped out? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, from the uh, I think one of the really key players from the, the one I can remember the most, two, two people that I can remember the most was uh, from the Empire side that were very 
uh, up of doing a merger. It was definitely great pace and uh, and um, also uh, Merv Brod, I thought was very instrumental. I think if uh, with his vote swayed the rest of the membership that that was the thing to do and that was that and he had very influential. He was the treasurer of that organization of the empire at that time. And uh, our side, uh, again, Bob Snyder, Rick Barrick, uh, I think they were very instrumental because they served on the, on the committee as well of, of trying to put this together. And the building that we're in right now was constructed um, in 1995 and we moved in here in April of 1996. Do you remember anything about that construction process or building the building? Well, I know that uh, through the I mean through the planning, uh, we we were able to. Uh, there was a lot of a lot of good heads that were put together for funding. Number one on the building, we actually brought in a lot of uh, uh, civic and, and and even borough officials to assist with our fundraising campaign. Uh, just some names I can think of is. Um, well, he was the uh, uh, the uh, the president there at Tarrant Rubber was uh, John Smith. Um, I know we also had uh, um, uh, we had uh, now the names are all slipping me. Um, Susan Cavanaugh, um, Jimmy George. Jimmy George, and then there was also Al Loomis was on there, who was a, was a borough manager one time. Al Loomis was there. Uh, John Ward, who was very big with uh, Carlisle Taron Rubber at that time. Uh, John Broges, an attorney in town. Um, and uh, basically, they kind of really geared us to, to assist us in our capital campaign. And those members would be one that would go out with one of the fire company members that sat on the committee and we'd go out and meet with other uh, officials from large industries. I know one day when uh, meeting with, uh, it was actually uh, Marlon Gibb was another one there. Uh, him and I went to uh, Giant Food to meet with Alan Noddle, who was the, the president at that time of Giant Food Incorporated there mm -hmm. for, for funding. So that all kind of really brought everything together. Uh, one of the big things to push to move away from the area we were in was that uh, Taron Rubber at that time wanted to close off B Street, uh, which was a very critical access area for us to get to the other area, to the schools and so on like that. They so, wanted to close B between College and Factory Street. That's correct. Which they did after the Friendship moved. That's correct. Um, so after moving into this building, uh, the Empire and the Friendship were then together. Um, do you remember that process? Anything stick out in your mind? functioning here? Um, well, it was it was definitely a, it was a trying time, I think so, uh, to be very honest with you, from because you uh, we had a governing board that would oversee the station uh, and those made were made up of members of both fire companies, but each fire company still had their own elected officers as to administrative and as to line officers and I think it was uh, it was hard to control both organizations, and what I mean by that is is setting a standard policy as to uh, for your members and so on. Because one station could decide, or one one of the companies could be decide to do something totally different than the other. So to try to make everything as a, a general practice, I think was difficult. Mm -hmm. Especially things like discipline, where it would be uh, different for the same offense for the same um, thing that would happen in the station, people would get different discipline. Yes. Uh, and that sort of came to a head uh, with the borough uh, in 2004 and 2005. Uh, they commissioned a, an efficiency study for the fire department. And one of the recommendations was that the friendship and the empire actually merge um, into the parent organization, Empire Friendship Firefighters. And there was some controversy involved in that. Um, do you remember anything about that and your role in that? I think the biggest thing was is uh, without really getting a lot into it, we actually had one organization that was pretty committed of wanting to do the merger and one other organization not really wanting to do the merger. So there was a lot of, uh, there was a lot going on and uh, it, it took a lot of, uh, 
to the municipality to really, you know, set forth and basically pretty much say this is what is going to be done. Um, and, uh, you know, since 2006 through that merger, I think that was definitely an improvement becoming one organization within, uh, within one building. And you were elected president of that merged organization, and you've been the president here since for 10 years. Um, as part of that term of your presidency, in 2009, um, the borough came to the fire companies again and said that we think that a merger is needed. Um, can you talk a little bit about that process and what your feelings were then? Well, at that time, I think it was a pretty scary situation between the three fire companies in town. Empire, Friendship, Cumberland, Goodwill, and the Union because uh, uh, basically we went to a meeting and it was pretty much stated that uh, each of the fire companies will put an RFP together and the borough will select who is going to be the emergency service provider within the municipality. So it was kind of like one's going to win here and two are going to lose out. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was, uh, wasn't a very pleasant meeting to kind of sit through at the start, but uh, uh, what really came out of that meeting I thought was uh, good actually as soon as we came outside uh, the officers of the uh, Empire Friendship were there and the officers of the Cumberland Goodwill were there uh, we kind of started briefly talking outside and uh, later on that meeting uh, we actually had an emergency meeting that we told we pulled all our officers together and met out at the uh, Empire Friendship station to discuss maybe that we ought to merge Mm -hmm. and provide a, an RFP as to a joint organization. And during the negotiations for that process, um, one of the things that came up was um, service contracts outside the borough and um, serving the outside municipalities. And all that was uh, consolidated into one organization, the Carlisle Volunteer Firefighters Organization. Um, have you seen that uh, as a positive or a negative, and what changes have resulted from that process? Well, I think it's become a very, very positive thing. Um, I can remember in my early days of just being with the Friendship Fire Company where each fire company would go out and solicit the municipalities for rural fire protection. And it was, it was basically everybody out there trying to figure out who could do the job for the least amount of money so it wasn't a benefit to the fire company because it was costing you more money than it was to run the service. But it was just generating call volume for your members is really what it came down to. Uh, the other thing it basically was I think one of the very disturbing things in the earlier days of the fire service that I can remember which we don't have today is we don't have a fire company in this town running by another fire company to go on a call and we, we did that when we had isolated uh, or separate, should I say, uh, mutual aid agreements, and, and we don't have that. I mean, so I, that, that's, that's a betterment for the whole department as well as it is for uh, the citizens that we serve. Um, I think something that I never thought I would see in, in my lifetime in a Carlisle Fire Department is uh, we're down to two stations where we were originally five, and the two stations that we have Carlisle Fire and Rescue of today and the Union Fire Company uh, get along better than they ever have as to the history of the Carlisle Fire Department. So I, I think the officers get along well, we work well together, uh, and, and I think we're on the right path as to what our, what our common goals are today. Okay. What are the concerns that you have? I think you just talked a little bit about uh, some of the areas that have improved uh, as far as cooperation and delivering better service by not running uh, equipment past fire stations, but what are the areas that we need to do better with and improve upon? Is staffing a concern? Well, well, definitely. I mean, it's, uh, it's the, the economics, I think, uh, uh, even though that uh, financially, I, I think that uh, the, the total merger has, has done better because of going from many companies down to, uh, to two. There's, there's not duplication of equipment. We, we don't do that anymore. So that is definitely a, a plus as to what we've done. But uh, again, over the years, unfortunately, uh, manpower is not there, as you said. Um, 
which is, is very much a concern. And it's, um, I think there's a lot of things that lead into that. I mean, as to just everybody in, in general. Uh, also, I mean, we still have to look at uh, the economics of today and what it's going to be like in the future and, and where we need to head uh, as to what our future goals are and what we can see ahead for us. Okay, I think that pretty much gets us chronologically up to now. Um, do you remember any specific situations um, at a fire or another emergency situation where you felt that you were in danger or you felt uh, scared, for no better word? Yeah, I can think of a couple of them. Um, uh, one was uh, a Molly Pitcher fire that we talked about some time back. Um, what happened? Well, I, we were on the, uh, which we would call now in today's sir, we used to call it the rear of the building or whatever, but if we would call that side C of the building, actually it was, uh, would have been actually the uh, uh, CB corner actually where the elevator shaft was in the back of that building at that time. Um, the uh, I went up in the uh, in the aerial device to go to the roof to assist in vetting uh, the roof. It was myself and another gentleman, and uh, not nice to say, but next time after I was on the roof of the vent saw, I turned around and the platform wasn't there that I got off of. Mm -hmm. So uh, very heavy smoke condition, couldn't see anything, and. Uh, Basically, what I ended up doing is I heard some other saws running through the smoke, which would have been towards side A or the front of the building, which was actually uh, Mount Holly's truck crew, and decided to make myself along the wall, the parapet wall, to come up and meet with those in a kind of abandoned side C because I wasn't going to be back there in unsafe conditions by myself. Mm -hmm. um, that being one, for sure. Um, Um, I can remember uh, one evening being the uh, when I was chief of, uh, and this was when I would have been chief of uh, the Friendship Fire Company. We were not merged yet, uh, but we had a uh, vehicle fire on the uh, on the turnpike right out by the K Street gate, and it was a, a motor home fire. And I can't remember. Both people that were on the line, I know one of them was a gentleman by the name of Todd Miller. I can't remember who the other gentleman was on the line. Uh, but we had a well-involved um, motor home fire. And uh, we were, uh, the engine was more towards the rear of the vehicle and they were progressing up along the side of the vehicle to try to extinguish a motor home. And as they were progressing up to uh, motorhome, uh, thank God they basically had full protected clothing on SCBA because the propane cylinder left loose on the motorhome. And it actually picked the firefighters up in a ball of flames and actually threw them up against the median barrier on the turnpike. So it was kind of a scary time of being the chief in charge and seeing your firefighters right. in that type of situation of not, you know, knowing that there is a propane cylinder on ball. But, you know, are going to be involved in there, but not exploding at the time as to the uh, as to the incident going on there. Right. Okay. Um, do you have anything else that you think it's important to to go over that we haven't talked about as of yet? I guess the only thing I guess I look at um, as I sit here today and, and think about the start of 40 years in the fire service and more up to exceeding 40 um, and, and, and moving forward and, and knowing I guess what the fire service was and, and, the, and, the, and financial issues that we had over the years to raise money and, and do those kind of things. and. And, and build a, a station of what we have here today, uh, you know, of all the hard work is, 
you know, hopefully our forefathers are glad to see what we're doing. I just hope is someday when I'm the forefather that I can hopefully that the ones that are going to take over are going to keep this going, you know, as to what we've done over the last over 40 years here. Right. Okay. Well, I think that's all my questions. Thank you very much for giving your time. All right.